Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my bed crimers, hi, how you doing? Hope you're having a great day. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out my channel. Let me just ask that after listening to or watching the video, if you find you enjoyed it or learned something, do me a favor, smash that like button and consider subscribing. Also, if you appreciate my work, please consider supporting the channel with a Patreon membership. Now, let's dig in. For those of you who were unable to watch the new 48 Hours episode on the Idaho student murders case, I wanted to share what I believe are the key takeaways from it. Kaylee Gonsalves's heartbroken parents, Christy and Steve, and her sister Olivia featured prominently in the episode. Christy expressed her deep upset that suspect Brian Kilberger waived his right to a speedy trial because she was eager to get answers. Now the family has to wait for who knows how long for Kilberger's trial. For the Gonsalves family and probably the other families as well, this waiting period is pure agony. The only family that might be in a state of mind where waiting isn't messing with their hearts and heads is that of Ethan Chapin. The Chapins have expressed that they will not attend the trial because it will not change anything. It cannot bring their precious son Ethan back. I believe they are very focused on helping his siblings navigate through this tragedy in a way that will be the least damaging to them. I'm sure the Chapins want justice just as much as the Gonsalveses do. But for them, maybe they feel that rests in the hands of the attorneys, the evidence, and the jurors. Christy and Steve reiterated how they learned conclusively of Kaylee's death. First, they received calls from some of their daughter's friends. Then, around 4 p.m. on Sunday, November 13th, 2022, the day of the murders, a deputy came to their home to tell them there were four victims, and one of them was Kaylee. Christy was shocked to hear the number four. She then asked if Maddie Mogan was among the four and was told, of course, yes. Kaylee's older sister Olivia was also on the show, and it turns out her web sleuthing right after the crime helped the Moscow police narrow down the students' activities prior to the crime and the timeline. Olivia figured out how to see who Kaylee had called before her death, and she began calling those numbers. Thus, Olivia was the person who initially spoke to the rideshare driver who told her that Kaylee and her best friend Maddie returned home alone in the early morning hours of Sunday, November 13th. The driver also told Olivia about the grub truck and its camera. Therefore, the video footage showing Kaylee and Maddie standing at the truck buying a pasta dish to go was located. And although that footage led to a lot of speculation and pain for some innocent friends of the girls, it served the purpose of establishing a concrete timeline. The Gonsalveses also hired a private investigator so that they could conduct their own investigation. And they believe transparency leads to justice. The Gonsalveses saw that Kaylee called her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, Jack, at 2.56 p.m. That's approximately one hour after Kaylee and Maddie were dropped off at 1122 King Road after getting the pasta. Christy and Steve believe that Kaylee fell asleep after that call. That would mean that Kaylee was asleep or falling asleep for about an hour before the perpetrator entered the home. Christy expressed that she's confident that the police have the right person in custody for the crime, Brian Koberger. Steve Gonsalves says he wants to see all the evidence and he's keeping an open mind. Now that doesn't mean he has ruled out Koberger as the perpetrator and that he believes he's innocent. It simply means he wants to see all the evidence before he announces, yes, I believe Koberger is the guy. There's a difference. And a lot of people are running with this and trying to say that Steve doesn't believe Koberger is the perpetrator. My take is that Steve Gonsalves wants to see all the evidence before he commits to that. 
He said he doesn't trust anyone or anything, and he has to see everything for himself. Christy, as I said on the other hand, is ready to make her judgment, and she thinks Brian Koberger did in her daughter. My take is that Steve doesn't want to come out and say Koberger is the guy, because he knows Koberger needs to get a fair trial. The whole gag order thing has prevented the Gonsalveses from speaking out on the case and from getting information about it from the authorities. So my personal opinion is that Steve is deliberately saying he's keeping an open mind so he isn't accused of condemning Kohlberger before he's had his trial. I think deep down Steve may lean toward Koberger being the guy, but he wants transparency in the case, and the only way to get that to happen is by reassuring the defense and the prosecution that they, meaning the Gonsalveses, will not both run around blaming Koberger publicly. That's just my take. I could be wrong. Steve said an officer from the Moscow PD told him that they believe Koberger had been scouting out the girl's rental house. That conclusion is based on cell phone records and cell tower data. We know Koberger's phone was in the vicinity of the girl's house on 12 occasions prior to the crime. Of course, that puts Koberger in the vicinity of the house. It doesn't necessarily mean he was smack at the house, you know what I mean? Christy believes Koberger possibly went inside the house at some point to check it out prior to the crime and that he knew when the home's inhabitants came and went. The Gonsalveses also tracked down what they believe to be Brian Koberger's authentic Instagram account and they saw that he followed both Kaylee and Maddie and that he often liked photos on Maddie's feed. This is one of the reasons, Christy at least, believes that Koberger had one target that night, Maddie. But when he found Kaylee and Maddie in Maddie's single bed, his plans went awry. They believe Maddie was attacked first and Kaylee second. Both Christy and Steve say there's evidence to support the notion that Kaylee woke up and tried to escape the room. But because of the layout and where the bed was located and where Kaylee was located, she was basically trapped. I believe the evidence they're referring to are the words survivor Dylan Mortensen thought she heard Kaylee say, which were, there's someone here. By the way, both Christy and Steve say that the notion that the crime was retribution for some drug deal gone wrong is, quote, hogwash. They 100% do not believe in that motive or scenario. Christy said she thinks the perpetrator committed the crime because he wanted to commit murder. The coroner also told the Gonsalveses that the attacks on Maddie and Kaylee up on the third floor occurred before the attacks on Zana and Ethan on the second floor. There was also discussion about Zana and her DoorDash delivery on the show. It's likely, as we know from the probable cause affidavit, that said Zana was on her phone looking at TikTok sometime after 4 a.m. I believe it was 4.12 a.m. to be exact. That Zana was awake. And it is believed that she may have come face to face with the masked stranger. She wasn't expecting to see this guy in the house, and he likely wasn't expecting to see her either. A criminologist named Brianna Fox was also on the show, and she brought up the sounds Dylan Mortensen said she heard coming from Zana's room, including crying and an unfamiliar male voice saying, It's okay, I'm going to help you. Fox feels that it might have been that the perpetrator hadn't planned to harm Zana and Ethan, but in that moment of running into Zana, he had to make a split-second decision. What should I do? Run away? or kill her, and he decided to do the latter. Fox also felt that it's likely the perpetrator didn't harm Dylan Mortensen when she peeked out of her bedroom because he was exhausted. Fox emphasized how fatiguing it can be to use a sharp object to do in four people. You may not always get that first slash on the neck, if you know what I mean, so you may find yourself jabbing through bone and muscle. And as for Dylan closing her door after seeing the masked man and not dialing 911 for more than eight hours, Fox said it's not unusual for people to freeze or be too afraid to intervene. 
I still say that maybe the perpetrator said something to her akin to, don't call the police if you want to live. And maybe only Mortensen and the perpetrator know about that brief conversation. I'm speculating, though. Fox also said that to get away with a crime like this, the perpetrator has to be batting 1,000. One mistake can prove the perpetrator's unraveling. In this case, that mistake may be the leather sheath with the microscopic bit of touch DNA on it. But Fox also said she doesn't necessarily see the prosecution's case against Koberger as a slam dunk, even with the DNA match to Koberger. Fox also said that the white car seen circling the neighborhood and believed to be Koberger's white Hyundai Elantra might not prove all that powerful at trial. She noted that the police changed the description from a white 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra to a 2011 to 2016 Elantra after tracking down Koberger's white 2015 Hyundai Elantra. Fox also pointed out that the defense doesn't have to prove that Koberger is innocent. All they have to do is show that there's reasonable doubt. Fox also mentioned the three sources of unknown male DNA found at the property. Two of those were found inside the house, and one was found on a glove outside the house. The defense wants to know who that DNA belongs to. The prosecution is sort of saying, we don't need to waste resources tracking down the owners of that DNA because we've got Koberger's DNA on the snap of the leather sheath. Bottom line, the DNA evidence, depending on how it's presented to the jurors and how the experts for both sides perform in court, can either prove Koberger's guilty in the jurors' minds or it can sow the seeds of reasonable doubt. No one can know how that will go until the actual trial takes place, but the DNA could prove either a slam dunk or it could prove a crack in the case. Author Howard Bloom was also featured in the episode. He wrote a long article about the crime for Airmail magazine and is currently writing a book about the case. Bloom said that from what he's heard, Koberger told his father Michael that he was having trouble at work at Washington State University and his dad felt he should fly out and be with his son for that long cross-country road trip. Per Bloom, that's why Michael Koberger went on such a long, miserable journey with his son. If that's true, then Koberger was being at least somewhat honest with his father about the hot water he was in at WSU. Bloom is also looking into the drug deal gone wrong scenario, despite the Gonsalveses saying that that's hogwash, and Bloom also feels that the prosecution doesn't necessarily have a slam dunk case. Back to Steve and Christy Gonsalves. They also mentioned the coroner's report about Kaylee's injuries. Christy said it was the ugliest, most disgusting piece of paper you will ever see in your life. She said, quote, because there are causes of death and contributions to death, end quote. She did not elaborate on what those were. To help us interpret this statement, I looked up the difference between a cause of death and a contributing factor. So a cause of death would be something like a fatal wound to the carotid artery. For example, a contributing factor would be another injury that maybe wasn't fatal in and of itself, but when combined with the other injuries would eventually lead to someone's death. The Gonsalveses also expressed that they believe the perpetrator came armed with a kill kit, that perhaps he carried a backpack or had one in the car and in it he had a change of clothing. That might help explain why there was not a ton of DNA found in the car reportedly, or actually no DNA found, or at his apartment. 
Island. Also on the show were Zanna Kernodal's older sister, Jasmine, and the patriarch of the family, Jeffrey Kernodal. It's the first time we've heard and seen Jasmine interviewed. Both Jasmine and Jeff's emotions when talking about Zanna were right at the surface, and the sadness bubbled up every time they spoke about her. Their grief is still very much raw. Jasmine was a senior at Washington State University when the crime occurred. That's the same university. University as Brian Koberger. It's frightening to think Jasmine was walking around that campus and possibly crossing paths with her sister's alleged killer. When Jeff was asked what he loved most about Zanna, he replied, everything. He described her as a people person. Jasmine said that she and Zanna were planning to start their own marketing company after they graduated. Jasmine also said that on the morning of the crime, she received calls from Zanna's friend saying something bad had happened. So Jasmine drove the 8 to 10 minute ride over to the house on King Road. She also called her father and told him to turn around and come back to Moscow. Jeff had been visiting Zanna that week. When he arrived at the house, he found it swarming with investigators. He and Jasmine were then whisked away to the Moscow police station. There was no more information on what happened once they were at the station. Christy and Steve said that in losing Kaylee, they lost the person in the family who got them to do things they wouldn't normally do. It sounds like Kaylee was the one in the family who got them all to do adventures. She would talk them into things that they might not normally think of. We know that Olivia, Kaylee's older sister, gave birth to a baby girl after the crime. She named the baby Theodora Maddie Kay. Olivia said that she believes Kaylee and Maddie were around for the birth, citing the odd coincidence of her room number at the hospital being 1113, which echoes the date of the crime, November 11 13th 13. Also, Theodora was born at 4.21 a.m. That's right in the window of when Kaylee and Maddie lost their lives. Despite those numbers representing a most tragic happening, they seem to give Olivia some comfort because she sees them as signs that Kaylee and Maddie are still with her, letting her know about their presence. So those are the key takeaways I gleaned from the 48 Hours episode. I hope you found this interesting I'll see you next time on Bed Crime Stories.